All right, this morning, grab your Bibles, open them up. If you would, make your way to Isaiah chapter 11. That's where we're going to pick up this morning in our study through the prophecy of Isaiah. And as you're landing there, let me remind you that one of the things that makes the Bible so powerful is that it is living, it's God-breathed, and one of the pieces that makes it living is all the predictive prophecy that's not just hanging out there uh, yet to be fulfilled, but there are prophecies that have been fulfilled, and those fulfilled prophecies then give us a hope and a surety that the prophecies that are not yet fulfilled will indeed be. And from the prophecies in chapter 10 that we looked at that concern the coming great tribulation, as God will purge and judge the earth, come in chapter 11 the prophecies concerning uh, the millennial kingdom. Just as the Bible does predict that as the end of uh, our human history draws near, there will be worsening times, so it predicts that then when Jesus, the Messiah, comes a second time, there will be peace in his millennial reign. And so in this 11th chapter, we have the Messiah, Jesus Christ, portrayed as the branch or the shoot of Jesse, who was King David's dad. And that is uh, then telling us that he is the son of David, a messianic title that the Jews were familiar with. He would come from the line of David. He was David's son as a branch or a shoot. But then in the second half of chapter 11, verses 10 through 16, that we'll look at this week, he is also the root of Jesse, which means he is before Jesse. So he is not just the shoot, he is the root. He's not just the son of David. He is also the Lord of David, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so we pick up in the 11th chapter in the 10th verse, and it reads, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place, or the place where he lives, uh, shall be glorious. And so the root's coming is proclaimed. And in that day, if you've been here with us, you'll understand that in that day is a phrase that refers to the last of the last days. The last days in the Bible refer to any time from the first coming of Jesus to the second coming of Jesus, and yet in that day refers to the very last of the last days when Jesus will return a second time. Now, again, the phrase, the root, uh, it portrays the idea that Jesse, David's uh, grandfather, uh, father, and, and Jesus' ancestor, is the, is the stump from which the shoot would come up from, and, and Jesus would be from the stump of Jesse. He's a shoot of Jesse. He's the line of Jesse, of David. But then the shoot who came from Jesse is also the root who was before Jesse, which makes us hearken to our reading. If you were going through the 52 greatest chapters in the Bible with us this week, we were in Revelation 1, where Jesus says of himself, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the one who is, I'm the one who was, and I'm the one who is to come. That Jesus, he has been before, and he will be after, and yet he is very present. And so this root is uh, signifying the deity of, of Christ Jesus. And the root will, it says here, stand as a, a banner to the people. Now, we found this phraseology in Song of Solomon, where uh, the Shulamite girl in the poem there is a picture of the church, and Solomon is a picture of Christ, and the banner that she was brought into the banqueting house, and there was a banner over the table, and it says that banner over me was, is love. And so we understand that uh, God is love, is what First John tells us. And so this banner uh, for the people would be uh, a place and a, a thing that would assemble people to a place. You would fly the flag or the banner, and you would assemble people often for war where God would take the people out to defend themselves. But 
in any case, sometimes the tribes were assembled with the banner. And it's one of the interesting names that God gives himself in the Old Testament. It's uh, Jehovah Nisi, as he's leading the people out of the uh, Egypt bondage in the Exodus. It's Jehovah, the Lord, uh, Nisi is my banner. And so when he would uh, go out in front of the people, symbolically, he would be going out as the banner was flown before the tribes. And the Lord Jehovah is always their banner. And from that place of love, he draws people to himself. Out of love, he defends uh, people for himself. And yet, interestingly enough here, it says the Gentiles shall seek him. Now, to you and I, we we read that and, and we're like, okay, easy enough. We're all Gentiles in this room, probably living here in the parkland. But to the Jewish mind, this was unheard of. You see, God had set the Jews apart to draw Gentiles to himself. They were a special people ethnically. They were a special people nationally. They were a special people spiritually. And they were supposed to have this relationship with their God that caused all the other pagan nations to want to to go and seek that God through them. And yet they did what uh, many Christians do today. They take the, the thing that's been given to them to shine a light into a dark world, and then they become elitist and uh, scared of and separated from the world. And so they actually shunned Gentiles, and they hated Gentiles. And, uh, and so you might say, well, man, that's, you know, those guys, they really blew it. But just, just think of... Uh, this, the Gentiles were to them uh, ISIS or, uh, you know, the terrorist of Islam. So that, that's what we're looking at here, that what the Jesus that we have here portrayed to us easily in the New Testament is seen to draw people to himself uh, by his church. Uh, they were having the same problem the church has in that uh, they, didn't, they didn't love their enemies very well. And so what he's saying is that the Gentiles are actually going to seek him just like the Jews, unheard, unthought of in Jewish culture. And, and to the degree that in Acts, when Paul, uh, at the end of his missionary journeys, is actually arrested in Jerusalem, you might remember in Acts 22 that he's arrested uh, because it's supposed that he brought a Gentile onto the Temple Mount. And the Jews hated the Gentiles so bad, think about this, handpicked by God, to draw peoples, nations, Gentiles to himself, yet they hated Gentiles so bad that there was a sign uh, there as you entered the Jewish temple proper that said, if a Gentile goes past this point, they can be killed. And, and so they hated the Gentiles so bad that it when, it when it was supposed that Paul brought a Gentile into the temple, which he didn't, by the way, they beat him up. He had to be rescued by uh, Gentiles, Roman officers. And as the people were howling at the foot of the fortress of Antonia, Paul said to his prisoners, hey, before, his guards, before you put me in prison, could I just speak to these crazy Hebrews that want to kill me for bringing a Gentile up on the, on the Temple Mount? And, and there he spoke to them and he started telling him his story. I was a Hebrew like you and I used to once persecute Christians, but then God changed my heart and and then he gave me this calling, and he gave me this calling to go share the gospel to the Gentiles. And it says specifically in verse 22 of Acts 22 that they listened to him until that word. What word? Gentiles. And then they went berserk. And the guards had to pull Paul back in because they couldn't believe that the Messiah would love the Gentiles. So, subsequently, they missed the Messiah that came to them, Jesus Christ. And yet, this is going to be part of the roots coming. He's going to draw all peoples uh, to himself. Now, in the 11th verse, it says, It shall come to pass again in, in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left. And he's going to recover them from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. And he's going to set up a, a banner for the nations. And he's going to assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather to gather dispersed of Judah from the four uh, corners of the earth. And so here in the 11th verse, the roots anointing is declared as the Messiah. He's going to reestablish what has been lost or he is going to, it says here, recover the remnant. 
Now, the Messiah will recover the remnant, and as we've said before, a remnant is a key theme in the book of Isaiah, that in every generation, God always establishes and protects and recovers a remnant of believers. In this case, it was Jewish believers, a Jewish remnant. And so uh, in the first return or the first remnant, we find this uh, directly following these prophecies. Remember, if you've been with us, that Assyria is prophesied that they're going to come sack uh, Israel. And in 721, they did. They rolled down and sacked the northern kingdom of Israel, capital Samaria. They carried off the people. And what they, in fact, did was they replaced most of the people with Gentiles to try to breed out the culture. And uh, they did that because no culture, uh, except for one, has ever lasted more than two generations without, without a homeland and an identity. And so uh, they thought, well, we'll just take care of them. And so that's what the Assyrians did. And in the south, Judah, uh, they were feeling pretty good about themselves in the fact that they were still established. You see, if you remember, uh, Judah was being attacked not just by Assyria, but they were also being attacked by Syria and Israel, a confederated army. And so when Israel was pulled out, Judah felt pretty good about themselves, but the Assyrian Empire gave way to the Babylonian Empire. And the Babylonian Empire started to make uh, encroachments into the land. And in 605 BC, they started carrying people away from the south, Judah and Jerusalem. And they eventually, in 586 BC, they destroyed Jerusalem, they burned the temple, and they displaced the the southern kingdom into uh, the Babylonian empire. And so for 70 years, the people were in exile. And then as God had predicted, they began to come back. And so the first remnant that was recovered by the Lord, it began to happen in 538 BC and people started to trickle back. And so Zerubbabel, he brought some people back and then they eventually established a temple. Then about a hundred years later, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah came back and they began to see the walls be built. And uh, as that was going on, the Babylonian Empire had given away to the Persian Empire. And then uh, between the time that the temple was rebuilt and the people returned, this first return, the Babylonian Empire gave away to the Persian Empire and the Persian Empire gave away uh, to the Greek Empire. And then the Greek Empire gave away to the Roman Empire. And the Romans kind of... They decided, well, you know, let's take the best of, of Greece. And so it was really a Greco-Roman empire in that it had all these Greek ideas and culture, but it, it was Roman controlled. And that's when Jesus came onto the scene. And in this first return gave way to the birth of Christ and the Roman world that would give us uh, Jesus. And then it would give us the, the highways and the byways so that the gospel could be spread across the Roman world. And, and yet, uh, as that's happening the Jews aren't happy. And so in 66 AD, right there in Jerusalem, the Jews rebel against the Romans. And in 70 AD, the Romans come in and for a second time, Jerusalem is destroyed. And for a second time, the temple is burned. And for a second time, the people of Israel are dispersed across the whole known world. And interestingly enough, they weren't just dispersed across the whole known world for 70 years, but not just one generation, not just two generations, but for 1,800 years, there was no Jewish identity. And yet, interestingly enough, while people would look at verse 11 of Isaiah and try to figure it out and scratch their heads and make up all kinds of different scenarios because they said, how could, how could any nation be able to come back after many, many years of being dispersed and spread out across the world? In the early 1800s, a uh, prophetic time clock started to tick again. And anti-Semitism began to rise to a place it hadn't been since the early days of, of Christianity in the Roman Empire. And, and Jews started to trickle back uh, to Israel, drawn by God. And then in the late 1800s, there was actually enough Jews in Israel that they started what's known as the Zionist movement. And the Zionist movement is this movement within Israel for people to begin to, to have a voice to establish a Jewish homeland. And about 20 years later, then that, that saw itself uh, some progress because at the end of the, the, the 
the war, World War I, the, people called it the war to end all wars because they thought no, no way would anybody ever do what's been done in this war to any other generation. Like surely we've learned, learned our lesson. At the end of that war, there, there was the Balfour Declaration. And, and so Lord Balfour actually declares that the, Jewish have an, the Jews have a need for a homeland. And so it happens. But the next 20 some years, it's under British rule. Uh, what we know now as Israel, and, and little by little, they kind of took back most of what they had given them, but, but there still was a homeland for the Jews, and people were migrating there, but then everything took a big turn in the late 30s when uh, Hitler rose to power, and he began uh, the Holocaust, and in, in the years that he was in power throughout World War II, as you know, he massacred over 6 million mainly European Jews, and so at, at the end of World War II, uh, there was this uh, outcry across the world for the first time ever. Listen to that. Helen doggone it. <laughs> uh, there was this outcry uh, for the first time really in Jewish history. For, for people to, to allow the Jews to have a homeland. And so in 1948, uh, there was actually a, a state of Israel declared. Now, um, the very day that Israel was declared a state, they were attacked by the Arab world, and there's no possible way they should have uh, survived, but they did. They actually not just survived, but they actually took more land for themselves, and so they were established. Now, I know you're, you're like, oh, thanks for the history lesson, but hang in there because look at this. A second time, a second remnant God's going to bring back. It starts in, in the 1800s. It starts to build some, and in 1948, they're given a homeland. So think about this. In 1948, when statehood was declared, Israel had a total of 200,000 people living there. And, uh, and yet, interestingly enough, uh, that year, the very year they were declared a state, uh, they had uh, two, excuse me, in 1948, they had 800,000 people living there. In that very year, 200,000 people flocked after they were declared a state uh, to Israel. So by the end of year, year one of statehood, they have a million people. By 1960, they have two million people. But what I want to show you is this. When you look at the graph, um, every spike in the graph represents... Uh, some kind of uh, political and usually military disruption in Israel. So the graph is pretty much static at about 25,000 people a year since 1948 have immigrated to Israel, which, by the way, didn't exist for, for almost 2,000 years. But every time there's a, a spike, it is when some kind of great uh, danger has come upon the nation and it, when there's uh, people attacking them or when there's intifada, people are blowing themselves up to try to kill them, then inexplicably, people, uh, Jews start flocking to Israel to immigrate there, to make Aliyah in the middle of chaos. And, and so I share with you that to say that now, 2019, there are 8 million Jews in Israel and, uh, and we understand that this is just the beginning of what God's going to do because when Jesus comes back, apparently uh, the Jews are going to continue to flock there to him as his banner is set up. And there are about 14 million Jews right now worldwide, 5 million of them living in the United States. And, and I'm guessing that when Jesus comes back, they're going to all make hiatus straight to the Holy Land. And I tell you what, this one makes the Bible so powerful. And we live in a day when we actually get to see uh, prophecies coming to life fulfilled. And, and the Jews, if nothing else, are God's prophetic time clock. They are something else. But if nothing else, they are God's prophetic time clock for the rest of the world. So his, his return, Jesus' return, is near. Now, all that said, you can take a deep breath. Look in verse 13. And also the envy of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. And Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not harass uh, Ephraim. Now remember from the ninth chapter with me that uh, the problem between uh, Judah and Ephraim was Ephraim was envious of Judah 
And they were coming down and taking advantage of their coalition to try to pick on their little brother, to, to, to try to set things straight. But interestingly enough, what it says here is when Jesus comes back, <clears throat> part of his rule, the rule of the root is going to be he's going to eradicate envy. So he's going to set up a banner and he's going to draw nations to himself but no longer is there going to be infighting. And, and interestingly enough, uh, envy is, is one of the greatest uh, sins to ever afflict mankind. And you might know that jealousy is uh, me wanting to keep what I have. And envy is me wanting what you have for me. <laughs> and, and look, resenting uh, God's goodness in others' lives is envy. And then also ignoring God's goodness in my own lives is envy. And really, this is, this is the thing. When you think about the strife worldwide, it's, it's envy. But in the Christian church, this is the deal. When I, when I resent God's goodness in the lives of others, I'm always wanting what somebody else has. That's envy, and it tears things up. But then when I, when I can't see or I ignore God's goodness in my life, I end up calling God's goodness, uh, you know, his disfavor even, or, or I, I, I don't, I'm not thankful. And that said, look at envy in the Bible. Think about this for a second with me. Cain envied Abel, what it lead to? Murder. Uh, the brothers of Joseph envied him. Originally, they wanted to murder him. They eventually sold him, effectively trying to kill him. They didn't want him around. Saul envied David. What did he try to do to David? Murder him. Uh, Lucifer envied God. And so what did Lucifer do? By the way, through the chief priests who envied Jesus, what did they try to do to him? In fact, they accomplished it for three days. <laughs> they murdered him. Uh, Corinthians says that if, if Satan had known what was going to happen on the cross, he wouldn't have done the whole deal. <laughs> He'd have been like, I'll rethink this. But envious. When we get to uh, Isaiah 14, you don't want to miss it because it describes the envy of Lucifer. He wanted to dethrone God. He thought he could be lifted up to where God is. And so that said, uh, James 3 says this, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. If there's, if there's strife and confusion in their life, there's probably envy. And yet, just as God's going to take away envy practically during the millennial reign, I believe that part of the rule of uh, Christ in a life is that he begins to eradicate envy. Uh, one of the things that's so tremendous about God truly ruling uh, your life is that he gives you the ability to be okay with who you are. And, and then he, he gives you the ability to see the things that you are and to see the things that you aren't and the things that you can change. He gives you the strength to work on those things and the things that you can't change. He either gives you the ability uh, to be okay with or he supernaturally does work in you that you could never do on your own. And this is some of the beauty of the rule of Christ in a life that he starts to eradicate envy. And you show me someone that's not envious and I'll show you someone who's got peace. And they've got joy and, and they've got contentment. And the Bible says in Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. And so the roots rule is described uh, here in verse 13. But then in verse 14... They, that's Ephraim and Judah, now that they're not fighting anymore, they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines towards the west. And together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall lay their hand on Edom and Moab. The people of Ammon shall obey them. So um, the root, his rule has results and some of the results will be that Israel's national prominence will be reestablished. They'll defeat their enemies when they're not fighting anymore. And then verse 15, the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the Sea of Egypt. And he will, uh, with his mighty wind, he will shake his fist over the river. He will strike it in the seven streams and make men cross over dry shod. So the mighty rivers, uh, the tongue of the Sea of Egypt is uh, the Nile. And the great river is always the Euphrates in the Bible. And so the mighty rivers will be dried up. And this is significant because uh, what he's doing is he's eradicating natural boundaries. And for these wicked countries, he's eradicating the lifeblood of their land. But when he dries them up, 
There's no natural boundaries. People can pass straight through. And this is significant because in verse 16, there will be a highway for, again, here's the remnant of his people who will be left from Assyria. That's where the Euphrates flows through. And as it was for Israel on the day that he came up from the land of Egypt, the idea is so it's going to be for those people in the millennial kingdom. He's going to make it easy, easy access to Jerusalem for anybody who wants to go be with the king. And I love this because it says there will be a highway for the remnant. And uh, that's, that's significant as well because when we get to Isaiah 43, we'll cover this again, that it says there in verse um, 16, this is what the Lord says, and then this is who the Lord is. He's the one who made a road through the sea. Now look at the end of verse 16 in chapter 11. As it was for Israel in that day when he came up for uh, from Egypt, so it's going to be for that remnant who returns on this highway. And the Lord, he's the same one who he made a road through the sea. That's the Red Sea at the Exodus. A pathway through the surging waters. And don't remember these earlier events, God's going to say through Isaiah in chapter 43. Don't recall these former events. What he's saying is don't live there. Think about them and then use them because I want you to look and he says, I'm about to do something new. Now it begins to happen. Don't you recognize it? He says, look up. Yes, I'll make a road through the desert and pass in the wilderness. And so when we look at the Old Testament or we see the, the miracles of God in the past, it's not so we camp out there and go, oh, I wish I was there. What he's saying is look back there and look at what I have done because what I have done is what I will do because who I was, I am. And who I am, I will be. This is the Lord, the Lord of hosts. And so he says, look back at the way I made a path or a highway uh, through the deep. Now, interestingly enough, uh, go with me just for a second on a little archaeological journey. Because uh, this uh, was kind of poo-pooed, this idea of uh, the Red Sea being uh, split open by God and the Israelites passing through uh, really for a few hundred years from, you know, the late 17, early 1800s when higher criticism became a big part of the study of the Bible. Uh, liberal scholars started to kind of poo-poo the idea of miracles. And so I can remember when I was a kid, you know, in the Bibles I had, there'd always be a few maps. I think I got a map or two back in the back of my Bible. And if you'd ever look in your Bibles, and it might be still the same today, when you'd see the Exodus, You'd see the route out of Egypt, which would be up to the top of that, where all the little red dots are. Goshen is where the people were uh, when they exited Egypt. And then you'd see the Red Sea crossing. And I can still remember scratching my head about this. It, it would have the little route of the, route of the Exodus, and it never would be across the Red Sea. It'd be up there where you kind of see them crossing, but it would be up in that little bitty blue dot to the very top. And that's called the Reed Sea. And, and so liberal scholars have decided, well... God probably didn't really, you know, blow the sea back in a wall. He probably just let them cross the Reed Sea because the Reed Sea is only six to 18 inches deep. <laughs> you know, so it, it, seems, it seems logical that they could cross the Reed Sea, which I remember hearing some pastor tell a joke when I was a kid that apparently, you know, some kid had heard this and then, and then said, well, gosh, if they cross the Reed Sea, you know, uh, the miracle would be how did... How did the, the Lord drown the Egyptians in 18 inches of water? So we got problems either way, right? But the, the issue is, the issue is that they probably did come out of Egypt up there. And the traditional uh, place of Mount Sinai, uh, according to the Catholic Church, has always been down in the Sinai Peninsula in the wilderness of the Red Sea, which you see there. But it can't be the case because historians have figured out, well, that's actually, that was Egypt controlled. That was Egypt proper. And the Bible says they, they went out. They went into the land of Midian, which is modern-day Saudi Arabia. So this guy was one of the first back in the 80s, a guy named Ron Wyatt. Uh, he was a guy who, he tried to find uh, Noah's Ark, and he spent a lot of time uh, researching the Exodus. And, and he kind of mapped out where he thought the Bible, uh, you know, had described where they were kind of hemmed in by the Egyptian army with the sea in front of them and mountains around them. And he, and he found this place by Nueva that's got this big old beach that could hold a couple million people. And so he thought, well, this is interesting. And yet the problem was always, 
if you found a spot, the other problem with the Red Sea or the Gulf of Aqaba was it, it's about you know, a few hundred feet deep there. And when, it, when you go out just a little ways, it drops off like a steep mountain cliff down to the bottom. And then when you get to the other side, it's straight back up. And people are like, well, how could, how could women and children, you know, old people and infants go up and down? It'd be like rock climbing. It didn't make any sense. So he got some sonar equipment and he started fishing around there. And he found, uh, you see down in the right-hand corner, I know it's a little granny, forgive me, but he found literally a, a shelf that comes up out of the bottom of the Red Sea. And uh, if the water were to be blown back in front of the beach that would hold two million people, <laughs> right where the Bible says uh, they were contained with the Egyptian army behind them, there was literally a super highway in the sea. <laughs> I like that. And then he started fishing around some more, and he found uh, golden Egyptian chariot wheels. Easy to find because coral doesn't grow on gold. Egyptian golden chariot wheels, uh, very close to the highway in the sea, and they date directly back to the time uh, of the Exodus. We got a pretty awesome God. We got a pretty tremendous book that reveals him to us. <laughs> And, and I tell you all that, not just for a history lesson, because if it's just a history lesson, it does, does us uh, no good. But I, I tell you that to say this. He's the same yesterday. He's the same today. He's the same forever. He's the God who, who was. And he's the God who is. And he's the God who is to come. And, and, and what the enemy wants to tell us is this. There are places in your life that are completely inaccessible. There are things that you've done. There are mistakes that you've made. There's bondage that you're going to live in. And that's the, that's the end of the story. Inaccessibility. So you're stuck here. You're going to always be dealing with this thing here. This feeling is always going to define you. This mistake. But the reality is this. It's not true. It's not true because of the living God. And for some of us, you know, we'd be able to look back and if we do it and not use uh, the word coincidence, which, by the way, does not exist and should not exist in the Christian language. We can look back and if we look back through the eyes of the spirit, we can see uh, maybe it wasn't our maybe he didn't part the waters. But similarly, he he saved us from a thing, right? I was talking to Joe Samples about him getting, he turned 16. I was telling him, you, you need to get your license and then you need, you need to tell your mom the, this phrase, pedal to the metal. <laughs> she wasn't very pleased with me. And, um, but, but I remember being 16 and getting my license and pedal to the metal. And I, I remember the 1989 Ford Tempo that I rolled five times down into a creek and and I, I can still see the pictures that my mom and dad have somewhere of the whole thing was smashed flat to the dash. It broke the passenger seat off at the shoulders. There was no headrest. And the only place that there was, it looked like a roll cage over the driver's seat. The only bump I got, I can remember rolling and I, I hit a string of mailboxes. and They all went through the window in front of me. I had a big boom box. Remember when some of you know boom boxes? It was rattling around. 30 pounds of boom box in the thing with me. The only bump I got was I had a broken arm from playing basketball and I couldn't get out of the seat belt. So I, when, I, when I was upside down in a creek, the water was rolling through the top and I pushed the button and fell out and bumped my head because I didn't have a hand to catch myself. <laughs> that's, that's a road through the sea. You know what I mean? That's not coincidence. That's, that's not luck. That's for whatever reason, God decided I wasn't going to die the day I was driving like an idiot on old highway in Reynolds County at 11 o'clock at night. That's, that's only God. He made a, a accessibility to life where there was no logical accessibility. And I don't say that to, to, to say anything other than because God did that in my life. He, he's, he opened a path through the deep, if you will. The truth is that he's going to do that with my life in the future. And some of that's just getting to live long enough. I remember turning 40 and Rhea Davis told me, 
I love this. She, she came up to me and she put her hand on my shoulder and she goes, you're going to love your 40s. And I said, why? She goes, because you're going to realize that all the mistakes you made in your 30s are not final. They're not final. That God's going to keep making a road and you're going to be able to see clearly. And here's the thing. What if, what if the next time I'm driving like an idiot on a highway at 11 o'clock at night, the road isn't, I roll the car five times and the only bump I get is I push the seatbelt and fall out on my head. What if he takes me home? The reality is this, ladies and germs. The reality is this. The greatest inaccessibility we have is to heaven based upon our sinful condition. Our greatest inaccessibility is to eternal life. And because of the banner of Christ, his love, he has made the way. So death is not a period. It is a comma. And when I meet that pathway, the highway has already been made in the deep. It's just that the, the narrow way is what it is. And he is the only gate. And that's the confidence I have when I think about Jesus. He's the same yesterday. He's the same today. He's the same forever. And as we get ready to observe communion, I just want to share with you this, that when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, uh, he put it in those terms. He said, I'm given to you in chapter 11 of Corinthians that which I already have received. And what he received was that on the night of Jesus' death, he took the disciples aside and he said on that night he was betrayed, that guess what? I'm going to establish this observance in remembrance of me. That's what I have done, what was. And, and then he went on to say, and I want you to do this till I come. That's what, that's what will be. But then he also said, I want you to examine yourself so that you don't drink and eat of my body unworthily because this one that was and this one that will be is the one that is. He lives in me right now by his spirit. I'm the very temple of the living God. And so when we observe communion, what he's trying to do is say, the things that you believe are obstacles in your life, they're not through me. The things that you believe are torn away forever, I want to bring back, recover, restore the years that the locusts have eaten. The things that you've decided are going to constantly be your identity. It's not I am because I'm the one who was, I'm the one who will be, I'm the one I am. I'm becoming whatever you need. So, Father, this morning, we pray that you would be that for us. And some things, Lord, we need the ability by your spirit to fight, to withstand unto bloodshed. Other things we just need you to do supernaturally. We cannot do. Only you can. There are thoughts and ideas and circumstances, Lord, that we've succumbed to that we believe are our reality and and Lord, uh, you're the Lord of all things. And submitted to your feet, anything that's planted uh, can be raised again. And only things that are planted can find new life. And so we pray that this morning as we wait upon you for a little bit here, that you would indeed uh, bring life where there's been death, that you'd bring roads where there's nothing but obstacles. In Jesus' name, amen.